Hello and welcome. This is Marxism Today with Red Wagner. A while ago, I received some questions from a listener about Marxism in our modern economy, specifically about stocks and supposedly free commodities supported by advertising. These are both excellent topics that any Marxist will need to address, so I decided they were worth an episode. Actually, at least two episodes, since in this episode we will only address stocks. What are stocks? Stocks are a form of capital, similar to how a workshop, factory, or machinery can be capital. They represent a small piece of ownership in a company, an ownership that can be bought but brings with it no real required commitment. It can be liquidated into cash or other stocks at any time. Stocks complicate the ownership of capital. They make it harder to trace and understand. They add extra layers and obfuscations to capitalist power relations, but they do not make them disappear. Capitalist companies that are not publicly traded might have one owner or boss. This kind of business fits easily into the Marxist conception of capitalism. There is a capitalist, and there are workers. Some large businesses are still run this way today, although going public is more common and we tend to hear more about public companies. If Marxism is going to mean anything in today's world, then we need to be able to understand the publicly traded company through a Marxist lens. How does a Marxist see a public company? The first thing a Marxist notes is the distribution of shares. Sure, it's possible for working class people to own stocks, but the question, who owns how many stocks, is really the important one here. Even as a holder of one stock in a company, I'm given the right to cast a vote in certain decisions. The problem here is that my vote is not equal to the votes of the very rich, because our votes are weighted by shares. If a rich man has 100,000 shares, then even if I could convince all of my friends and family to vote the same as me, our votes wouldn't stand a chance against one very wealthy person. If we look at the distribution of shares for any large company today, about 15 to 20 people own the vast majority of stocks. These people are sometimes called the major shareholders. To a Marxist, these would be considered one type of capitalist. They function much like the human embodiment of what Marx calls the coercive laws of competition. I say this because the major shareholders generally do not run the firm. Instead, they elect a board of directors to run it. Now, if the board of directors does not return a high profit or is not competitive enough, the major shareholders will elect a new board with new members. This is a way to ensure that boards who care too much about the environment, workers' safety, or anything else that might get in the way of profit This is a way to ensure that those people do not get on the board, and if they do, that they don't stay there. In a publicly traded company, the market and competition fill this role, but in publicly traded companies, major shareholders are a kind of human embodiment of these mechanisms, making the laws of our system seem like nothing more than greedy rich people. It's true that there are many greedy rich people, but this is not the source of our problems. For example, it's popular to blame greedy Wall Street bankers for the financial collapse, but remember, these people are fulfilling an institutional role. Blaming greed pushes the blame onto something slippery and poorly understood, human nature, when what is really at work is a system designed to function this way. It's important to remember that a capitalist has a boss too, and his boss is the market, which, in a capitalist economy, controls him. With stocks, there's an intermediary. The board of directors must answer to the major shareholders, who in turn respond exclusively to the market, since they enjoy the dividends or increased value, but don't have to worry very much about the daily operations, working conditions, or the reputation of the business in the community. Since if any of these become a problem, they can sell their shares and instantly sever all ties to that company. That is how stocks function for the capitalist class. We now turn to the function of stocks for the middle and working class. The first question we must ask is, 
Does owning stock make me a capitalist? No, but the stocks do influence the middle and working classes. To investigate this influence, we will first address the topic of social reproduction. The idea here is that society must be remade on a regular basis. No society is natural, normal, or the result of inevitable outcomes. In our capitalist society, we look at two means of social reproduction, ideological and repressive. Police are a good example of repressive means of reproduction, one where force is used to maintain private property rights that capitalism needs to function. If you attempt to violate private property rights by, say, stealing food, even if you are starving, then police will forcibly stop you, thus reinforcing capitalist property relations. Stocks, however, can be used as a means of ideological social reproduction. Since social services in the U.S. provide only a meager amount of assistance to retired workers, those who can afford to will often save for retirement. This saving, however, is undermined by inflation. The average inflation rate is about 3% each year, so workers effectively lose money each year that their savings do not grow. You may already be able to see how this is going to push workers into a capitalist mindset. Workers who save for retirement need to invest their savings in order to maintain their wealth, and possibly to grow it as well. This is the main way that workers save for retirement, this and possibly paying off a house. Now, uh, note that this is not the only way for society to take care of their elderly. We could have a strong social safety net that would provide comfortable retirements for people, but we don't, so investment is the best choice for many people. What is the effect of having workers invest in the stock market? Now, their interests are aligned with the capitalist class. For example, if I don't work at Walmart, but I own Walmart stock, then it's actually in my interest that Walmart workers get paid very low wages and are not offered health care. Raises to workers or providing them with decent benefits may cut into profits and lower my dividends or the value of my stock. In fact, some unions have fought against investment plans based on stock in their own company because it puts the interest of the retired workers at odds with the currently employed workers. One group wants lower wages and higher dividends, while the other wants higher wages and lower dividends. These unions are aware of the ideological power of stocks. They have the power to convert working class values into capitalist values. They have the power to turn one section of the working class against the other in a kind of divide-and-conquer strategy. Far from equalizing society, stocks have divided it more. They have pitted worker against worker, allowing some workers to imagine that they are not working class, while all the time keeping wealth and power just as concentrated in the hands of the capitalist class. Finally, I'd also like to mention that some Marxists have seen stocks as a way to bring about social change. The ideas on how to do this, however, will have to be a topic for a later episode. This has been Marxism Today. Thanks for tuning in. This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.